Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to our first general session uh, for the 2021 International Association of Black Actuaries Annual Meeting. Uh, once again, joining you virtually um, from all across the globe, we're very grateful for all of the participation, um, all of the membership, our allies, all individuals all across the world um, that tuned into our, our first express session that we just finished about actuarial market trends. And now I am so excited uh, because we have a very um, engaging, interactive and fun session uh, scheduled um, all about um, our journey or a journey into leadership. Um, once again, I'm Chris Cooper and I have the awesome pleasure and privilege of being your host and master of ceremonies for these next couple of days. Uh, I think we're going on year number 10, if I'm not mistaken, and I just always find it such a, a pleasure uh, to be with each and every one of you. Now, I'm excited because we're about to engage in a phenomenal conversation uh, with someone who is no stranger to uh, IABA. In fact, um, today's honored guest and keynote speaker uh, was a keynote speaker, excuse me, at the annual meeting. Um, the last one that actually took place in my current hometown of Atlanta, Georgia. And the feedback was absolutely phenomenal. So I'm elated once again uh, to engage uh, with this extraordinary man um, in a more intimate setting. 
Um, so I encourage you, go ahead. If you haven't grabbed them, grab your pen, grab your pads, turn off anything that rings, dings, or sings, <laughs> uh, or, or that will distract you. Uh, because I know uh, that our amazing speaker is going to drop some incredible jewels of wisdom and inspirational nuggets um, that I'm sure will expand your mind. As the song said, we're about to blow your mind. Um, I learned this a long time ago that once our minds are like parachutes. Once they expand, they never go back to their original dimensions. Um, so let me begin by introducing George Nichols III. Um, he has a beyond impressive background, countless honors and achievements. And if I were to read his bio verbatim, we'd be here until tomorrow or the next day <laughs> or the next day. Um, so I'll be brief, but I definitely want to highlight uh, some of the amazing things that are germane to this discussion today. Um, George Nichols III is no stranger to first. He was Kentucky's first Black insurance commissioner. He was the first Black president of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners and the first African-American elected to New York Life's executive management committees. I am so excited to see him today as he's in his new role as he serves as the president and CEO of the American College of Financial Services. Um, in this role, he launched a four steps forward plan uh, to promote upward mobility and wealth creation for us individuals in Black America. George Nichols exudes enthusiasm and inspires others to lead at all levels. And it's because of all of this um, that we invite you to come along with us on this exciting journey into leadership. So I have some questions prepared and I'll be asking those, uh, but understand that you will have the ability uh, to share your questions as well. You see the chat box right there at the bottom. Uh, just put your questions in there um, and we're gonna be able to lean in and get insight and guidance um, from this amazing fountain of knowledge in the form of none other than George Nichols III. Good afternoon, George, and welcome hey. back. Hey, Chris, thank you very much for having me. I'm thrilled. I consider it an honor with, when really smart people like actuaries ask me to come back. So I must be doing something pretty well. That's a thrill. And I want to congratulate you on your 10th year. It's, it's really phenomenal that you're bringing the folks together and helping each other uh, to climb higher. That's great. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I'm honored, like I said, I'm honored to, to be a part of this. So um, for those of you that may, for those of you that may have never had the awesome pleasure of hearing from George before. Um, we're going to begin at the beginning. So I'm just going to give George, I'm going to toss the baton. I know the Olympics is going on. So I'm going to hand you the baton. And we're going to begin just simply with this. Just tell us a little bit more uh, about your journey. Sure. So I, I think the first thing when I try to share people the basis of what I've become today, it, it does start at the beginning. I, uh, I grew up in the racially segregated South. Uh, I had uh, the, the, the advantage and disadvantage of being an athlete, uh, being black and being funny. And when you were black, athlete and funny, they just thought you was dumb. And so that's how I grew up. I actually used to tell people that my last name is Nichols and the N word was put on me so often that at times I thought that was my last name and I wasn't sure. But the reason that becomes important is that as I started growing up, even at a young age, my spirituality became important because I didn't want to wake up every day and say that just because I had no power, I couldn't lift up. So I had even something bigger than me that could, could move all the other stuff out of the way. Now, as an athlete, my goal was to be in the NBA. I mean, I'm thinking Michael Jordan, LeBron, James, that was me. Now, I didn't make it there, but at least it allowed me to get out of the hood, out of the projects. And, and put me on a path where I could get an education. Now, there was an interesting thing that, ha thing that happened to me during the course of my education. Uh, I was uh, in my first year at junior college playing basketball. I had to take the exams to find out where they wanted to place you. And then they told me they were gonna put me in a remedial reading class. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, because, now like, I know I wasn't the smartest guy in the world, but I believe that I'd gotten pretty good grades. I worked very hard and they were saying, you know, George, you're on a ninth grade high school reading level and you're freshman in college. And it almost destroyed me because now just imagine all I ever cared about was basketball and I did work to get good grades because I wanted to go to a good college. But, you know, for someone to tell me I'm that far behind, a professor came up to me and, and explained it to me. And he said, you know, it doesn't matter where you start is where you end. 
Hmm. Here's what we're going to do. For the next semester, you're going to come to my house every night. My wife's going to feed you supper. I'm going to teach you to read. And then you're going to explain to me what basketball is. So for a full semester, I did that. And at the end of the semester, I was on a sophomore reading level for college just because he took the time to do that. That was the first time I ever learned that there was more to life than basketball. Hmm. And there were these other components of what I needed to do. And then it also helped me think about mentors that I didn't think much about that it opened doors for me and it pushed me to do certain things that were not sports related. And that set me on a path. And then it just seemed like every step I took, there was somebody that said, hey, you know, let's give George a shot. Let's give George a shot for this. Let's give George a shot. And that put me on a career, a path that uh, has been been really impacted by a lot of mentors and spot. And, and the thing is, it's people that I know and don't know. There's people who open doors and I don't even know who they are. And they just said, well, you know, I think there's this guy over there. Why don't you call him to do that? And that also brings me back to the spiritual point. That's the belief that I have, that there's somebody that's much bigger than me that is, is helping orchestrate these things that are putting people in my life that have set me on a path. And it's just open door after door after door. And, and my job is to, to walk through it and keep the door open for others to follow. I think that's phenomenal. And I love, um, I, I know a lot of individuals, especially in African-American and, and black communities in general, um, you know, sports has played a major, um, I guess, part um, and I think that even in sports, there's leadership lessons, you know, to yes. be learned, right? And I have two boys myself. My oldest is a sophomore in high school now, and the baby boy is is going into middle school. Um, literally next week, school started already. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think about those qualities um, that that you learn through sports, that you learn from mentors, that you learn from all these other individuals. Um, so, so when you think about that, what would you say? Um, a leader actually is. So, so like when you think about leadership, right? And what a leader actually is, is it, is it a coach? Is it a individual that gets people to follow them? Like, like how do you define leadership and what a leader is? Uh, leadership is service to me. I, I, you know, when people ask me to use or find a word, mm -hmm. I'm a servant leader. Uh, leaders don't have people serve them. They serve people. And, and so when, when I think of, of it, you know, there's, um, like, and again, I, you'll, for those of you, I, as I talk about spirituality and my faith, uh, I, I always try to be respectful for mm -hmm. where people are in their own faith. And, and I, but, you know, since you're interviewing me, I get, I get to tell you about me because that's all Absolutely. I Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, on my desk at home, and on my desk at work, I, I have a statue of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. Hmm. That's what leadership is to me. Mm -hmm. And because I'm trying to set a, a tone, I'm trying to set a way about how we should go. Mm -hmm. And I have found that the more people we lift up, the more people we create opportunities for, that comes back to us. And that opportunities are created for us as, as, as leaders. So it, it really, to me, it always comes down to, to service. And, and when I see leaders who are like, you know, you got to do this for me and you got to do that for me, I, you know, I'm not sure that's it. And when I think about coaches, uh, you know, uh, to me, a good coach figures out what drives you to be your best. Mm -hmm. and figure out how to create that because your best becomes a part of the team and then the team wins so that's that's really what it is wow. excellent and I, and I love of course um the the spirituality component as well as the servant leadership i mean i think that that uh servant leadership is a spiritual principle like it, it, yes. it just is right and um and it's basically giving um greater of yourself you know uh you know doing things uh not to be seen and not to receive the accolades, not because right. of that, because it's the right, right thing to do, right? right. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Jen Rohn um, often talks about, if you help enough people get what they want, you'll get what you want by default. 
Exactly and right. That, you know, that, you know, that encompasses this whole concept. And I'm, I'm really big on serving leadership as well. Uh, so I can geek out on that all day. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, but, but you did mention a, a great part of your story about individuals um, that helped you, you know, along your journey, you know, those that you know, and those that you don't know. Um, and I think that brings up the question. A lot of times when we talk about leadership, um, individuals need to really understand, uh, I think, the importance of mentorship as well as sponsorship, right? And if there's a difference and what that looks like. And I know that many of the, uh, of the actuaries and, and the students as well um, that are tuned in would definitely love to get your perspective on, um, you know, on, on that mentorship piece as well as that um, sponsorship piece. And how does that work in this whole sure. world, world of leadership? So the first thing I, I firmly believe that you got to understand there are two different things. Uh, I have found mentors as the people who give me advice. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. now, it, but they give me advice. A mentor mm -hmm. is trying to guide you and make recommendations. And, and you go and you communicate back and forth. You ask questions and you mentor. Sponsorships are different. Sponsorship to me, especially when I think about my career, is I'm not in the room. My sponsor's in the room. Mm -hmm. And my sponsor is speaking on my behalf. They're willing to put their reputation, they're willing to put their clout on my name saying they should have this change. Because see, the majority of us are never in the room. Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of people who give me advice. So I got a lot of mentors. <laughs> I need somebody that's willing to say, no, 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 this is not about advice. This opportunity exists and George should be the one doing it. We've done it for other people. Let's do it for him. And, and so I always are trying to push uh, our community, our people. Mm -hmm. We have to build those relationships where that we have sponsors. Because if we're not in the room, how do we get in the room? And the only way you get in the room is if someone in there lets you in. And, and so when people say, well, I got great sponsors great mentors. And I'm like, well, how many of them have helped you get promoted? Hmm. Right. I can read a book and get some advice. Right. The book doesn't get me promoted. Mm -hmm. So it's building a different type of relationship. The other thing that I think is important in both of those situations is that you have to understand you need to bring something to the table. Because that's the other thing is like, people go, it's like, will you be my mentor? I'm like, well, what do you want me to do? Well, help me get somewhere. Well, what do you want to do for me? Well, you the mentor, you the one in the position. And what you're gonna do for me? Can you give me some advice on what young people think? Can you give me some advice on, on people struggling in your situation thing? Mm -hmm. I can be smart about the people that I lead. Mm -hmm. You have to bring something to the table. When you think about that in the context of a sponsor, I have found the other role for sponsors is not just opening the door and giving you an opportunity. There's a development need there. Mm -hmm. my sponsors are the ones that say, George, all right, we're great. You went into the role and you did pretty good. Now, let me tell you what you didn't do well at and what we got to get you some help on so you can do better. That's development. They're thinking about how am I going to be better so that I can be more successful so I can keep moving up. So there's, so when I tell, you know, sponsors, someone will say like, well, open the door for you. I hope you make it. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't know what it's like to live in the room. Right. Somebody's got to help me figure that out. <laughs> So sponsors have to do that development. So now you have to change your relationship. You've got to be open. You're not going to like some of the things that have been said, but you have to be open to that because if you have the right sponsor who wants to develop you, they're just giving you the, 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 the know-how to navigate. And you will find that even if they tell you how to navigate, they're also teaching you how to think. Mm. Because they're telling you how to navigate based on how they navigated, and they may be a white male or a white female, and you ain't white. Right. So you're <laughs> going to be a little different. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking that way. You're like, okay, I got the basics. Now I have to be able to read the tea leaves and evaluate how do they do that for Black folk? And it may be different. But that's the other part of that. Now, the more successful you are, that's what you're giving back to your sponsor. 
nothing makes a sponsor more happy than you being successful. Because guess what? They get to they get to bring more people along. Correct. And they get to look, every one of us wants to be a part of something bigger. So if I if you become big, Chris, and I was able to help you, I feel a part of that. Those are things we got to understand. And, and right now I see too many walking up to mentors and sponsors. Well, what can you do for me? Can you get me promoted? Can you give me another job. No, you got to tell me what you're going to do. And then we can figure this out together. All right. And I'm so glad you mentioned that. And I think that is a, a, another huge development lead for a, a need, excuse me, um, for leaders overall or aspiring leaders is the self-efficacy and the self-advocacy and peace, right? So as you say, people come to me, I want to get mentored. I want to, okay, so what does that look like? You know, and, and, and it's, and I think the other part is that it's not my responsibility as the mentor, or even the sponsor from that perspective to reach out for you. You want this, like you need to come after this in a way that shows me that it's, as you just said, that it's worth the time, worth the effort, worth the energy. Um, and it's a reciprocal relationship, as you said, yes. you know, everybody's, if they want to admit it or not, they listen to the same radio station, WIIFM, what's in it for me, right? right. <laughs> and because they're looking, you know, for that, um, what do you think are some of the, I guess, some of the, I, I would say, uh, not necessarily tips and, and, and tricks, uh, but some of the qualities that would be um, um, necessary for a good mentee or sponsoree? Yeah. Uh, it, you know, I always start with this one. Whatever job you're in, whatever job it is, mm -hmm. you must be knocking the ball at the park. Right. Okay. Now don't, I mean, I hate it when somebody like, you know, I don't like the job, you know, I'm doing okay. I do what they, I do what the job description says and, and I don't know why they won't promote me or come down and felt me. You know what? <laughs> I got like a hundred people, 200 people, a thousand people that do exactly what their job description says. Mm -hmm. okay? And let me tell you the ones that I promote, the ones who do more. Right. The ones that are really, really show me, you know, it, 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 there's an old saying, you know what? Uh, we, we are talking about financial education for, for Blacks. And there was a, a, a saying my wife sent me the other day that I'd seen several times before. Okay. If you can't, if God gave you a thousand dollars and you can't handle a thousand dollars, why do you think he's gonna give you 10? Right. <laughs> so think about it. Mm -hmm. You're in a job, mm -hmm. you got a job, you got mm -hmm. you got an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then you telling me that I ain't got no more return than whatever's the basics here. And then you're saying to me that you want me to be your mentor to take you to another level when you're not even trying to get to another level at the level of which you are, of which you have control over. Now, I'm not saying if your boss don't treat you right, that's a different issue. But if you get the same chance that everybody else is and you're not knocking the ball out of the park, okay, we're, that's table stakes. Because now I know you're willing to put forth the effort and you're already thinking about how do I do more to be more? So that's the first thing that I always say to folks. The second thing is, when you come at, at, at them, you just, as you said, okay, it's a reciprocal relation. You should actually walk in and say, I'd like you to be my mentor because this is what I'm trying to do. And the reason that I chose you is X. Mm -hmm. you, well, you do that well, you're here or whatever, and I want you to help me. And what I want to do, what I think I can bring to this is X or Y. And you want to do that and you want to be able to deliver it. Most of them don't, I mean, you know, it, it enticed me that I want to work with you. <laughs> oh, you know what I remember? Man, they said Chris is over there with the action ones, man. They said, man, he's knocking the ball out of park, really. Like, you know, Chris came up to me the other day and he was talking to me, he said he liked, wanted, wanted me to be the mentor. And, you know, it was already, he was saying like, you know, I'm one of the leaders in this organization and I'm, and, and I'm really pushing myself out there. I'm putting myself out there. I'm doing interviews and other. Okay. Now I got somebody that I see that is willing to do the extra because the people that are really successful do the extra. Mm -hmm. They do the extra when ain't nobody looking. That's, that's really what this is about. And so you really have to think about that because, you know, it, because one of the things that I, I worry about now is like, you know, a lot of white sponsors are just looking for some black person to say they're working with. <laughs> and then some black person just happens to not working with them. Well, you know what? That is a bad mixture and it ain't going to work well. Yep. Sooner or later, that, that, that tire going to go flat and we ain't moving no more. <laughs> and so 
you have to start already and know where you're at. But it, it, you know, so if you if you knock it out of the park, then you come to the people that you want to mentor you or be your sponsor, and you're talking about what, you know, why I've chosen you to be someone to help me, but also what I can bring to the table. And then after that, it really does come down to can you deliver? And if you don't deliver, you know, can I, you know, is there a logical reason? One of the things that I have always had with every sponsor I've ever had is what I told them. All right. After I explained to them what I thought I could do for them and what I wanted out of them, I said, you got, there's one thing that is really critical in our relationship. And they said, okay, what is it, George? I said, I have to have the ability to privately ask you any question that I'm curious about. Hmm. Example. Why did you say that to that person in the meeting when they said this? Because see, I want to understand all of it. I'm not going to make an assumption that I understood mm -hmm. doing that. It might be something important in that. And when they start seeing the curiosity that you have, mm -hmm. you're trying to process it and not just apply it that if this situation happens to me, but let me apply it in a broader context. I tell you what, every sponsor I've ever had actually wanted to do more for me because first of all, they felt like, wow, George is really interested in what I'm doing. George is really believes that I can teach them and help him mm -hmm. grow. So they actually get more excited the more questions I asked. But I did, I said, Little, you know, I get to ask you anything because I don't want to make the assumption that I know something I truly don't know because I ain't never been in this situation. <laughs> and say, well, this is what they do when you're running a billion dollar company. Well, George, when was the last time you ran a billion dollar company? <laughs> so I probably better ask some questions about what it's like just to make sure I understand. Now, that's another part of that development thing is mm -hmm. teaching you how to, the people that I want around me are critical thinkers. Right. People who can uh, take their knowledge and adapt and apply it to a variety of things. They can take their critical thought process and apply it to different situations. And the only way you do that is you just got to keep putting yourself out there, but you got to answer the question. And I'll tell you, every mentor, every sponsor I've ever had, when I start saying, I get to ask y'all kind of questions, they lie, their eyes would light up because if they're committed to you, they want to help you. I love it. Yeah. I love it. And I think those are some amazing points. Um, you know, just being the person um, that you want to ultimately become, right? You know, and starting from that from that perspective. Um, so having said that, I guess, um, you know, you, you've had a very extensive career. You've done lots of different things. You've been the first this and the first that. Um, but when it comes to leading, um, and I actually found myself in this situation when I first got out of college, actually in college and out of college, of uh, being the youngest and the darkest in the room at the table. And, um, and, and in doing that, um, having to understand um, that I had earned my my, I had earned my place at the table. Now I had to sit at it the right way. Right, right. And, and I think that some of the things that I learned um, in that process um, involve understanding and mastering leading individuals that necessarily didn't want to be led by me um, because I was black, because I was young, because all that kind of stuff. You know, my back, I come from engineering, but I'm not an actuary, but I come from engineering background and same thing in technology and young and black and all that kind of stuff. So what, what, it, what have you done in your career when you've experienced those individuals, whether you're say, coming from the South or different places like that, where they just literally are not taking to your leadership style or don't want to be led by you simply because it's you. Sure. So um, the, the first thing that I have always tried to do is to understand what is it you're opposed to? Are you opposed to me being Black? Are you opposed to me being tall? Are you opposed to me being <laughs> you opposed to me being young or old? Right. I got to understand that first. Right. And right. sometimes it can be multiple things, but mm -hmm. I understand that. Because once I understand that, I'm going to do all that I can to take that away from you. Okay? So if I, 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 this is a true, true real situation came up. So uh, I was 28 years old and I was appointed to run a state psychiatric hospital, 28. I'd never run anything. It was in trouble. We shut it down. They said, we got a mm -hmm. last chance. Let's let George do it. 
So I show up <laughs> and they're announcing me and we're talking. And then after the announcement, the everybody's coming up, introducing themselves, you know, and like, I ain't got a clue what I'm doing, but they coming up and I'm getting it. Right. And so this one lady, a nurse, one of the best walked up to me and she said, I just want you to know that my son is 28 and I'd be damned if I'd work for him. And I showed the hell ain't going for you. Mm. And it was, just, I'm like, well, they're meeting you too. <laughs> okay. Right. She became my biggest supporter mm. because see, I said like, you know what? I promise you, you're never going to have to deal with my age. What you got to deal with is what it is we're supposed to be doing. I said, now what's your job? She says, nurse. I said, I would think as a nurse, the focus is to make sure we take care of our patients, right? She said, of course. And I said, but if I showed you my commitment to taking care of the patients, would it matter to you what age I am? And she looked at me. She never quit. <laughs> because once you understand, there was nothing about patient care that had anything to do with my age. There was nothing about patient care that had anything to do with my color. And once... Now you have to fight to do this and it's time consuming. It, it, it's, it's a lot of energy, but you have to understand their motivation and then you have to move them to the place where, what is it we're supposed to deliver? Mm -hmm. When you get them there, they're either going to have to accept that you know what you're doing, hopefully you do, mm -hmm. or now I have a performance issue and I can get rid of you. But if you understand the motivations of people, because sometimes we walk away and, and I, really, I wanted to, under, I, I never thought the woman, it was a white lady, I didn't think she was racist. I really believed it was an age issue. Right. Just think about it, I thought, no, she really wasn't like that. And, and then I'm trying to deal with, well, I, I couldn't make myself any other color, but I'm trying to deal with that <laughs> mm -hmm. when she's thinking of her own son. I had to get her past her son. Right. And so if you're going into these situations, you know, we have to understand what are you going into battle? Now let's talk about sports. Do you know why most people like athletes? It's because if a, a really good athlete is on the field, on the court, whatever, on, you know, on the gymnastic mat, mm -hmm. they are adjusting immediately to changes in the environment. Mm, that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is why we lack athletes because mm -hmm. an athlete figures it out and they have to make sometimes split decisions. Now, in most cases, we don't have to do that, but it does teach you to evaluate the environment in which you're in and adjust. And mm -hmm. smart athletes, even in the work environment, evaluate the, the environment and they adjust. And I adjusted to age. I've had to adjust to blackness. I, you know, if you're racist, that's fine. But now we still got to talk about, you going to take care of my patients? Right. <laughs> right. So I'm not, I, I have to, I got to be smarter and say, you know, I got to move you away from dealing with what your, your limitation is to keep us focused on what is, because that's the only place I can go that I know I got some control. The rest of it, I'm never going to make you like young people. I'm never going to make you like black or white folk if you don't like, I can't, I ain't going to try to do it. I'm going to put you in the place where we should be dealing with because then I can even the score. That's the way I've always done. Love it. Love it. Now, I guess, um, I guess the other thing is when you look at it from a, a skill development perspective, like I said, you, you know, being um, in charge, uh, being the, the first black insurance commissioner, and then you, uh, being in charge of the organization of insurance commissioners. And then now, I guess, in your current role as a president and CEO of a college, right? <laughs> um, what, what are some of those transferable skills uh, from a leadership perspective that you feel like you've taken in each of those instances that's gotten yeah. you to where you are today? First of all, in every one of those situations, I have put in the extra work to be good at that situation. So, uh, you know, I, I didn't know how to, I didn't know anything about being an insurance commissioner. And so I said like, okay, I got to go work to do that. I had, let me, let me find out what the job is. Let me go find out people that, that have done it well. And let me go talk to them. And, and then I'm going to figure out how do I have to become competent and good at this so that, that I can at least put that in the category of, I got that going for me. 
All right. And then it's, it's, you know, once you've done that, then you're like, okay, I gotta, you know, your, as you said, that your mind isn't, is a, is parachute. a parachute. It's expanded, okay? yeah. mm -hmm. All right. Then you can't ever close it. Mm -hmm. you're, you're never there. You're, you're never good enough. And you're always, and I know, it, you know, I wish you didn't have to, but you just got to keep getting better and better. But the first thing is you got to really get into understanding what it is I'm supposed to do. I then go to what I just said that I want you to start with. If you want me to help you, can you knock the ball out of the park? I can evaluate things and say, okay, where can I have quick wins? And then where can I make the parachute look bigger? <laughs> okay. Because everybody wants to be around a winner. Right. Well, how do I do that? And I take that to every job. The other things that I've always done is I'm always trying to take in information. See, most of us only want to listen to people we think are smart. <laughs> I want, you know, you know mm -hmm. my mother quit school in the sixth grade and she's the smartest person I've ever met. I could talk to my mother about stuff and I wouldn't even say to her, you know, mama, you probably are not sure what I'm talking about. And she said, well, I'm not, but let me tell you what y'all to do. She never gave me bad advice. But see, we have gotten in this thing was only certain people. Well, if you're taking in information, okay, and mm -hmm. you never know when you're going to be able to apply it. And it didn't have to come from the smartest person. It just had to come from the most knowledgeable person about what it is that you're trying to deal with. So I'm, I'm always applying this, this knowledge and trying to take more and more in. You meet more people, you know, and, and I, I know there's a lot of introverts and I get that, but you know what? The only way you're ever going to, no, is to talk to a whole bunch of other people. And you gotta come out of that and 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 whether you're reading, but I'm always trying to take that in. And every time I get wins, I, I put them back and I'm like, let me build on the next one, build on the next one. Now here's the downside because this is this is the flaw that all my teams always complain about. I I feel I've gotten really good at that, which means that you don't always celebrate your victories. Mm. Mm -hmm. You got to celebrate. Your right. You got to step back. So, you know, we did pretty good. Mm -hmm. Now, I unfortunately, one of my mentors said, um, the seeds of defeat are sown at the victory table. Hmm. And it like stuck in my head and I can't get it out sometimes. But you got to celebrate your, your, your successes. But I also am one of those that, you know what? It's a new day. It's a new game. And I got to play. It's a different team. And I can't rest on what we did last night at that game that we won. We got another game. And so I'm always constantly trying to push myself. And then, you know, again, understand and evaluate the, the, the environment, apply the knowledge, and then see if I can get the win. I love it. I love it. And, and it's, it's so funny you say that. I, I guess we're similar in that. One of the biggest things, you know, for my assistant and other people, they say all the time is, and I have two stickies on my computer now. One says breathe. And the other one said, celebrate. Because <laughs> I was so used, much like you, like I said, to go, 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 go. And I think that, you know, as high achievers, as leaders, et cetera, you know, we may find ourselves there. But one lesson that I learned, I think is very germane to this topic is the importance of just being present, like authentically oh, yes. being present. And I think that uh, that's, to me, that's the biggest gift we can give to anybody is our authentic presence. Um, being there in that place, not all the way down the road, not thinking about what's next, just being here with you in this moment, yes. you know, in, in, in this conversation. And I think that we have about another 260 something other individuals <laughs> that, are, that are looking in and peering in, you know, at, at, at this particular experience. So I got another question. actually. Well, before you do that, I got to say this. Now, Chris was saying that, that you all hear what I'm saying, and hopefully you take some nuggets. I hope you took that nugget. I don't care whether you excel at what you do, you want to go to the next level. Take the nugget he just said. Be present. Be in the moment. And, you know, there's almost 700,000 people that are not in the moment anymore because of a COVID you know, pandemic that we meant to be in the moment. Take that nugget that you just heard from your colleague. Excellent. Thank you, sir. And I'm glad that you reiterated it because I think, and that was the present moment there, right? Being yep. present in, in the moment of understanding that. Um, so having said that, a couple of questions are coming in. Um, I have some more, but I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm gonna, we're in a good vein and I want to okay. continue flowing here. Um, so this question actually is kind of a flip side to the conversation that we just had. 
in regards to, you know, to being the leader and, and wanting your, um, your team and other individuals to respect you and that kind of stuff. So the question came in and it says, have you ever faced situations where you were looked down upon or downplayed and how did you handle it? So now it's kind of the flip side uh, of what we just discussed, not people not looking up, quote unquote up to you, but now you're being downplayed um, or looked down upon. And how did you actually handle that? Uh, I think every situation I've been in my career, up until the one I'm currently in now as president and CEO of American College, I've walked in and someone's looked down on me or thought less of me, uh, thought I wasn't capable uh, for the job that I was in. So yes, it happens, it, it happens all the time. Right. Uh, how I've done it, uh, you know, it's sort of the same thing where I said, I don't let you deal with me in that space. You know, I'm not going to let you deal with me hmm. as a black man. Mm -hmm. I'm going to force you to deal with me as the president of the college. And I'll give you a, a, a perfect example. Uh, when I arrived at the American college, we had a, a trustee board of 40 people and a foundation board of 40 people, 80 people. Hmm. And 90% of them were white males who had grown up in the college, had designations, and it was their college. And though they were having trouble, which is why they brought me in, like, who is this guy? So the first meeting I go to, I'm in the job three months, and I say to them, well, first of all, I'm really disappointed and embarrassed that I don't know two thirds of you because if I was trying to figure out who you were in the last three months on the job, I would have never done anything related to job, which the <laughs> point I'm trying to make to you all is there's too many of you. So what I'd like to do is I would like to merge these two boards and get them down to a more workable solution around 25 people. <gasps> who the, what? Uh, uh, that, and, and, and so then all of a sudden at break time, everybody, all these people's running me, if I were you, I'd go back in and tell him you, you, you were just saying that and that you just going to focus on running the college. And I said, I'm not going to say that. That's exactly what needs to happen. Man, they're going to take your legs out. You done. You done. You, you ain't going to make it. Clear. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I went back in and I said, I appreciate all y'all giving me some input that maybe I shouldn't have you know, said anything about this. But here's what I want to talk to y'all about, because this is how I'm going to come at you. Just so I'm going to give you a fair warning how I'm coming at you. And they were all like so focused. And, and I said, how many of you love the American College of Financial Services? I love it. I love it. Then we're going to talk about what's best for the American College of Financial Services. This ain't about you and it ain't about me. Now, within a year, we merged the two boards. We have a one trustee board of 25 people. And we did not lose one of those individuals because I called every single one of them individually and said, thank you for showing your love and commitment to the American College. Not to me, not to board governance, none of that stuff right. about the college. And now my job was to make sure this, the college was improving. And I said, because of the sacrifices you made, okay, this is what's happening. And we've still been able to engage them. So I can tell you, they were not happy. They looked down, people trying to figure out why me, why this black guy. And, and there are times that I've even said to myself, you know, if the place was running well, I don't think they would have picked me. Hmm. They usually let us run stuff that's messed up. Mm -hmm. I figured they would, but they were, they really looked down on me. And then, and, and then I made it worse that their first interaction was they need to go away. Right. <laughs> so, but right. You know what? My leadership was not about me or them. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I think that's, and that's so powerful. And I think that that's also what you just mentioned, that personal um, connection, right? Um, I know that we kind of, kind of had a little pre-show before we got on here today. And, and we just talked about, you know, us being so, of course, through COVID and that kind of stuff, being geographically dispersed and disconnected of sorts. Yep. Um, but that, call that you made to each and every one of those individuals 
was was something wasn't a text message wasn't an email wasn't it was like hey i'm i i am here with you i'm present with you i'm letting you know that i appreciate your time i appreciate what you're doing and i think that that definitely speaks to um true leadership right and understanding and understanding the people that you're leading right understanding their needs uh, because as you know, you know, my Angela everybody said it, lots of people said it before, they'll forget what you do, but they won't forget how you made, how you made them feel. Exactly. And, 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 and that feeling, you know, that emotion um, that, that swells up inside of them, of course, because they love the college. They told you that, you know, with pride, of course, I'm sure push them uh, to, to, to make that happen. Um, so we have oh, tons of questions coming in. Um, a, another one um, is... Okay, so what advice would you give for someone who's in an ideal situation to be a leader, but the money and the compensation is not there? So kind of the show me the money um, experience. Yeah, so um, if, if, if I got to tell the group that, that there were some questions that were sent to me that uh, that we were might get to, and I want actually want to use one of those questions mm -hmm. that I was going to give to that to that point there. Okay. Question was, what would I tell my twenty five year old self or my forty year old self? Right. Mm -hmm. And what I know today. Right. That is, it, it's related to that. I have done uh, exceedingly well financially, uh, beyond my wildest dreams. I mean. Uh, there, you, couldn't have, you couldn't have beat me in the head and says, you're going to have money when you grow up because I didn't believe it. <laughs> uh -huh. so where I'm at now is just off the charts. But what I would tell my 25-year-old and my 40-year-old self is that you really ought to think about how important is the money, the title, versus the happiness, the joy, and the satisfaction of what you're doing. Now, I have three adult kids, and um, they are all doing well financially. They are all doing well in their career, and they're all unhappy. They make good money. They don't like the job that they're doing because it's really not fulfilling the things that really excite them every single morning, but it allows them to hang out with their friends and go to the places where they're supposed to be seen. And, and then they can go buy what they want to buy. And then they sit and they say to me, but you know, they're really happy about it. And I said, but I saw your Instagram. They <laughs> said, you should have saw the 12 pictures it took me to get the one that right. really, I was smiling. Okay. Right. That's what they were saying. Right. And so I said to them, like, well, let me ask you a question. I know that you all think only old people think of this. If they told you that you only had one more day, what would you do? Would you want to go try to make some more money? Would you want to go get that job that has the title? Would you want to hang out at that party that really no one is really free at, but they just to be seen? Is that what you want? Well, no, I'd want something more meaningful. Well, that's what I tell my 25-year-old and my 40-year-old self, because sometimes I made decisions then mm -hmm. the amount of money that I was trying to get or the title that I was getting or what I thought people would, would respond to. And then I found that no one of those people was paying none of my bills, hmm. helping me when I was struggling. Okay. It wasn't giving me. Absolutely. And I wasn't happy. And then to think that I'm doing this because of some perception that I have. So if the money ain't right, or if the money is right, and you don't like what you're doing, I tell people now, okay. Go do something you love. You got it. And, and, you know, you can figure out the money part. Uh, I, you know, somehow or another it will work. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can't drive a Ferrari, okay? And maybe you can't live, you know, and you're kind of been on the east, up east side. <laughs> but, you know, I'll be honest with you. Man, I've lived in some all white neighborhoods. I've no, I've not lived in big houses. I'd really just rather live around some people that I like because mm -hmm. I didn't like the people that I live in. Right. And that's the part that I, you know, don't make decisions on money. Don't make decisions on title because it'll come back and haunt you and, and you won't be happy with it. You, you may have the trappings of what you think of life, but you know, at the end of the day, I want to be able to look in the mirror and say, you know what? I feel good about where I'm at. I feel good about what I'm doing. I feel good about, 
the people that I've helped and the people that I've touched. And I know that, and, and, and people say, my family and friends say, hey, George, you can say that because you got money. <laughs> so I get that. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you what, I, I know the importance and the value. Mm-hmm. That really is. Right. But you have money because of the fact that you do think that way. That's and exactly. I think that is a, that's a huge huge thing you know when you, when you talk about it, you just mentioned something that's really profound and I want to uh, just make sure that I amplify it as well um, I, I'm a, a, a elite peak performance uh, and executive coach trained by Tony Robbins and all that kind of great stuff and I'll never forget one thing that Tony Robbins taught us that I, I will never forget and it speaks exactly to what you just mentioned and he said this thing about that achievement, is a science, but fulfillment is an art. And, and I think that from technical individuals, actuaries, engineers, mathematicians, insurance people, et cetera, you know, they're so used to, we're all so used to, um, you know, if this, then this, right? It's, it's, it's a science to achievement. This is the pathway. Take the exam, get the job, you know, get the fellowship, get, you know, get, the, get, get just follow this path. And it's just achievement, 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 achievement. But as you just said, achievement without fulfillment is empty. It is. And, 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 and what fulfills you is different than what fulfills me. And it's different Thanks. than what fulfills, you know, anybody else that's on this, um, that's in this session with us. So I think that, you know, as, as individuals navigate, thank you so much for sharing that. And, and giving that, that, that advice in retrospect, you know, if you were 25, what you would say is, you know, go after what you love, go after the passion, go after service, go after others, right? right? And like I said earlier, you know, as you help other people, you'll get what you want by default, including the income and the money and the compensation. Yeah. Ultimately. But two things, my, my mother, uh, my mother, had, I, my mother and father were with, I, I, I grew up in a family, my mother and father were there. My mother had the greatest influence on me and my mother uh, was, I consider her my best friend up until the time I, I met my wife, who then became mm-hmm. my friend. And my mother told me two things. And she said, you know, if you don't ever remember anything I ever have told you, remember these two things. The first one was, she said, it is better to be known of good name than of great wealth. Hmm. Okay. Right. Second thing she told me, only what you do for others will last. Mm-hmm. I can make all the money. I can put a statue up and somebody can knock it down. But if I've touched someone that keeps living, that remembers what I did, then my legacy will live on. And that's what I want people to understand. And when you think about the technical aspect, I remember reading about Steve Jobs. I mean, look at what this guy did. Look at how much money he had. But you know, in his last couple of days, he said, I don't want nobody hanging around me, but the people I love. Right. He didn't ask for his iPhone. Hmm. He didn't ask for a Mac. Okay. He didn't say what was the stock price. He didn't say how big is the company. He said, put a people who love me. Mm-hmm. For these are my last days. And, I, you know, and I'm thinking like, money can't buy all that for you. Power can't buy all that for you. And, and, and if you did it wrong, you may not have nobody to love you either. Right. That's what I try to get people to think about. And I, and I wish I were better at it when I was 25 and, and 40. And I tell my kids, like, if you all learn this, mm-hmm. live an average life, oh my God, look at how much, look at how much impact you can have than, than, than more than what your father ever did. I love it. I love it. And I think that another question uh, that we had earlier um, that was in the list of questions I had for you, and you kind of just brought that up. And and this is, I think, the struggle that individuals sometimes have. It's this concept of this authentic self and bringing your authentic self to the work, to the job, to the experience. And then also this other thing that happens back here sometimes, that imposter syndrome. Yes. So, so can you share, I guess, from your um, perspective, um, do you feel like you've been able to bring your authentic self to work? And, and, and what are some of the challenges um, or opportunities or even great things that happen as a result of you doing that? And then yep. the second question I have is going to be about how did you deal, if you dealt with that imposter syndrome, and how did you ultimately push past that? 
Sure. Uh, so first of all, let me say that I have been to be able to bring my authentic self. And part of it, I've surmised, is that be, when you're the first and, and, and the majority has decided we have to have one, they really want you to be black, but sort of white. Okay. Now, before Bill Cosby got in trouble, everybody called me Cliff Huxable. They don't call me Cliff no more. Okay. Got you. Got you. They used to call me Cliff. Me and my wife, we were Cliff and Clara Huxable. It was a black family. Everybody wanted to hang around. It was white. Right. They friends. And I was black enough for them to be their friend, but I was white enough to make them comfortable. Hmm. So because of that, I always knew that whoever George was, I could come in the table. I could come there and I was going to be just fine. So I've been able to be my authentic self. But there's a there's a point here that I think we have missed in that question. What authentic self are you talking about? Mm. Okay, because see, they didn't hire me to like play a role. They didn't, I'm not good, I'm not in a movie. They they hired me to run a college. Mm -hmm. His authentic self, who he is in that role, but he has to deliver this. The mm -hmm. job. So when one talks about their authentic self, it may be your dreads, it may you know, be your earring in your nose, it may be your tattoos, it may be how you dress, that's your authentic self, but can you deliver what it is I actually pay you to do? Because I didn't pay you just to show up. Mm -hmm. So I always say when we ask that question about the authentic self, okay, that we have to understand that there's who I am and there's what I do. And as long as you can merge the two together, typically they more than happy to accept you in your authentic self. But you got to make sure that you merge those two. All right. So that's the first thing. The, the other part of the question about this imposter syndrome, I will tell you right now that at my age, I still say to my wife, sooner or later, they're going to figure out I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and she's like, I've been doing it long. I said, I know, but I still ain't figured it out yet. Mm -hmm. So every day I'm wondering like, man, am I really as good as, as they think I am? Am I good as I think I am? And, and I'm really an imposter. I don't really know the details of that. And, and, and I get nervous and, 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 and I still struggle with it, even with all the things that I've achieved. So I, but here's what you got to do. I do know I'm smart enough to figure it out, at least to get through the day. Mm -hmm. And I'm also figured out that all the other people that I thought was really smart, they ain't no smarter than I am. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I have taken the moments that I feel like an imposter, when I feel like a fake, that I really feel like, I'm not sure I know what I'm talking about. And I'm saying, you know what, George? You got to have confidence that you work this out all every other time and you just have to figure this one out too. And it may be new. You just going to have to figure it out because that much you actually have shown yourself. So I try to find the place where there's strength to take on the new. Hmm. That's what I do. And, 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 you know, and, and I don't, sometimes it, it may be something you did in a job. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's something that had nothing to do with work. But I'm trying to find something that's similar, that I was able to succeed, and just to take that little nugget of confidence and momentum and say, you know what? I'm going to take another step on trying to work this out to get beyond my own limitations and fears and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and this, you know, this thing of not feeling like I really know what I'm doing. We all feel it, but some of us are better just covering it up and just working through it. But I, I still feel that. I, I, I mean, again, to this day, and, and, and it, you know, and, and, my, uh, and my wife, my friends are like, no, I can't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I'm <laughs> telling you, I'm the one that got to go through it. Believe <laughs> it. It really does exist. But there's nothing wrong with that. Do you do you feel like you grew into that, or do you think that that has been kind of a part of you, like your whole career? Like when you were first starting out, and when you were thr thrust into situations, do you feel like that you've gotten more comfortable with? And I'm gonna use this word. You didn't use it, but of being resourceful enough 
to yes. be able to navigate to navigate yes. those things. Yes. So it's been with you, you think, since it, the it, it always has. And and actually, again, it, it goes back to being an athlete. Mm -hmm. You know, you're walking out on the court you, and I'm playing basketball and and, yep. and I think I'm all that. And and then, you know, some guy that's six nine comes out called Magic Johnson that knows how to dribble the ball better than I do. <laughs> talk than I am. Well, I think you better make an adjustment today. Yeah. And as you yep. figure those things out, mm -hmm. you know what? It doesn't matter what it is. You're going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, you know what? You ain't going to always win. And that's okay, too, because you learn something about yourself. So everything that you're doing, you're trying to, you know, it, it, to me, that's the way I, is. I'm like storing all of this. I'm storing it. I'm storing it. And then at the right time, let me pull this piece out or pull that piece out to mm -hmm. get me through this. But it is it, it, from the beginning. And then you just... You get stronger and better. Now, here's the thing that I, and, and I gave a presentation a, a couple of weeks ago, and, and I'll talk about this faith because I think what you just asked me is important, but I got to tell you the other side of it. Don't let that become your weakness. Okay. Sometimes our greatest weakness is our greatest strength. Because I'm always walking in thinking I'll be able to work it out because I always. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I think of the story of Samson. Samson believed that after Delilah cut his hair off, he'd just shake him off like he always did. Yep. His strength became his weakness. You have to know yourself, or you need to have a close friend that knows you to tell you about yourself mm -hmm. so that you don't. As you build that resistance and, and, you, and the resilience of it, that it does not become your weakness. You always have to check yourself, always. I love that. And, and I think that also goes to something I, I'm sure, I know I was taught it. I'm sure you were taught it as well. Um, I have it written down on, on the question list of this whole concept of uh, being twice as good as to get half as much. Um, so, so, so what are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, what, what is that? What does that mean? Do you do you agree with it? Is it is it something we should be teaching our kids now, you know, in 2021? Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I believe it. I live it every day. I believe that <clears throat> we as blacks have to be twice as good. And I need to say this. And if you're a black female, you got to be three times as good. I think black females have it worse than black males do in, in this environment. And, and, and I, um, you know, when I know that we are, we, we're going through the George Floyd moment and, 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 and we had, I mean, if you think about even back to slavery, we always have had whites with us. Mm -hmm. We've always had whites. I mean, a lot of the things that we were able to do was because whites helped us. So we've always had that support. But when I stop and think about we still struggle with, with, with color. I, I, I mean, I, I know we get more open-minded, but we're still struggling with color. We, we're, we're still dealing with it. And, and, and so I feel, and, and, and it's, you know, I live in, in, in the suburbs of Philly, okay? And the number one crime area is West Philly, which is closest to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and my wife and I, we'll get in our car and we'll drive over to West Philly, you know, and, and there's people I've met and I go over there and, and black folk tell me, me, but watch out, black, not white people, black people tell me, be careful when you go over to West Philly. And sometimes when we drive, I say to my wife, it angers me, it angers me that I fear another black man. Think about what I just said. I, as a black man, fear another black man in West Philly. Now I know it's crime and they said like, you know, they said like 50 people got shot last weekend, you know, four died. So I get what I'm walking into, but think about the concept of me, a dark skinned black man who grew up in those environments. Mm -hmm. Still saying, I feel. And as long as I see that, even in my own life, my own world, then I have to keep teaching 
young Blacks that I'd rather you be twice as good to succeed? And you know what? If they only ask you to be once as good, all the more better. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. You'll still be twice as good as they are. <laughs> That's all the more better. Right. But you just, it, it, it's real. But I'll tell you, don't underestimate the fact that Black women have it worse. Mm -hmm. It's three times better. And, and that's the part that I am most concerned with is that black women are the, they are the gatekeepers of our communities. And, and yet what I'm seeing them have to go through both by sometimes what we do to them and what happens to them in corporate America. If I could do anything, you know, one of the things we're trying to do with American college is how do we help advance black women and we made that conscious decision because of the role they play in our communities you affect and improve their life mm -hmm. you just improve the generation today and generations of the future absolutely and i i 1000 percent agree and actually i'm from philly originally that's my that's my hometown uh so and my parents literally just left to fly home we were on vacation last week in florida and they just flew back um to philly i'm from north philly originally they live in northeast now and uh, you know the same conversations that you just had about uh the crime and and those types of things and it, and it is very um horrible right that that they like you said that as a black man you have to fear a black man right and then specifically check this out a young black man because yes. most of the atrocities and stuff are happening at the hands of 14 year olds, 13 year olds, 15, 16, this individual, it just shouldn't happen. Right. So, so when we think about, you know, that, you know, that element of giving information and passing on nuggets to the next generation, what would you, what advice would you give to, to these actuaries, to individuals that are, that are um, engaging with us in this conversation in regards to what are some of the leadership traits and things that we should be teaching our kids right now, understanding all of the, the, the dynamics of the world in which we live? Yep. So the first one I, I think is integrity and values. But, you know, we, we, you know, the, I tell my kids all the time that cheating is still cheating, even if you didn't get caught. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Can you catch yourself? Mm -hmm. So if you don't start with integrity and a value system, all bets are off. We're just at another thing. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, and, and, I, and I've actually had white people say to me, like, why do I feel this way? But I feel responsible for my people. I feel that the gifts and the blessings that I have, I have an obligation to share them and give them back to lift up my community. And a lot of us say, I got mine, you get yours. Hmm. A lot of us move out and never go back. I believe that as we succeed, that we have to go back to West Philly, to North Philly, wherever it is, to the projects in Bowling Green, Kentucky, we got to go back and we have to help lift up those communities. And it's just one person at a time. I'm like, hey, you got to do all everybody, but we've got to figure out how we go back. I always feel like it's our responsibility. And I, there, was a, there was a black man in my early life that owned a construction company. He's like the only black man I knew that had a lot of money. And he had a construction company. And I was like, man, you really done made it. He said, yeah, <laughs> let me tell you something, George. No black person should ever be jealous or envious of another black person until all of us have something and all of us don't. Hmm. Now I'm thinking like, man, that's deep. But that's why I feel like if, 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 if we don't, who will? You look at all the communities in America right now that are being gentrified. Well, notice they started out trying to help the black community and then right. Hey, you know, they bought the houses up. I'm helping them out. I'm buying the, I'm buying the property. Where did they move? And then all of a sudden, these nice places grow up and we can't live in them. Well, if they're doing that, and, and I'm not saying all of them are doing that. I'm not saying that, but, but I'm saying we who've been successful need to go back and we should be a part of the solution in the community, not let me get out of the community and never return. Mm -hmm. I'm 
and that you know you you know because I know what's there, but I am saying you know what, start an after school program. Uh, you know, I, you know Philly. Uh, I just found out a month ago about Cobb's uh, Creek Golf Course, mm-hmm. right in the black neighborhood of West Philly. I mean, a really unbelievable nice course that now is is in disarray. I found out it was designed by the same architect who designed the nicest course in Philly at Marion. And so now there's a group of, of white folks that have come in and said, we're going to fix this up and introduce golf back to the black community. And they came to me and said, we'd like you to be involved. I said, I'd love being involved. But I got two things I got to tell you. First of all, we can't gentrify the place. Okay. And that if we're not reaching out to the community to get black kids involved in golf and, and education and all the other things, I don't about, they said, that's we're in for that. Well, now I'm willing to do something, but right. there's these resources, but none of them, we got to go back and help. We got to go back and help. Mm-hmm. got to do it. I love it. I love it. And, and I think that also, and, and I think that, you know, as we take on initiatives and we take on different things, uh, one of the questions that came through um, said that, it, George, it seems like you're always learning and working and networking and on the go. So having that heart to serve all the time, how do you prevent burnout without missing those magic moments or opportunities for advancement? So how do you kind of balance those things? Yeah, uh, so first of all, one of the things I've always done is every thing I've ever volunteered, <clears throat> and even in my job, I've tried to incorporate my family. So if I was doing volunteer work, it was something that I thought my kids would enjoy so that I could take them and they could participate with me if I'm gonna be away. And now the things that I do, I'm like, how do I think about my wife being incorporated in that? So the first thing is my security blanket is my family. So I'm always thinking about how do I incorporate my family into all the things that I'm trying to achieve and participate in. That's the, 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 the first thing. The second thing is that when I walk in my nice house, when I drive my nice car, when I put on my nice clothes, I know why I have that. I've been blessed and I keep giving opportunities. And I firmly do believe that with great gifts comes great responsibilities. Absolutely. I find myself that all the things that I have, I have to give in order to show my appreciation for them. Mm-hmm. I've also found, which is what you actually said earlier, I found that the more I give, the more I get. Mm. And that's go back to that higher power. And so for me, this is easy. I'm just, I don't even think anything about it. I tell my wife, like, I ain't never going to retire until I can't work because I like giving because so much has been given to me. Think about the richness of, of, of relationships. You know, it, something I didn't know is a number. There's a couple of, of Tuskegee Airmen that live in Philly. I didn't know that. Can you imagine hanging around somebody that's mm. like you hear me, that mm-hmm. through that? Man, that's pretty cool. So when I think about all those opportunities, it's really easy for me because I, I walk out every day optimistic that I'm going to meet someone, talk to someone, touch someone that's going to give me something I did not have yesterday that I'll be able to use tomorrow. And with that optimism and, and that richness, I mean, I can't help but have energy wanting to learn some more and meet somebody else and do something else and then know that I can take all those resources and that that power that I've now been able to amass and lift up other people. I love it. Living and giving. That's what exactly you're doing. Right. Living and giving. I love it. I think that's phenomenal. So I guess the other question that, that came up um, was in regards to um, should everybody aspire to be a leader? I mean, is that, is that something that, that, that everyone should look up to or want to ultimately become, or is it reserved, quote unquote, for certain types of people or certain things? What would you say to that? I actually believe all of us are leaders. I, I really do. I, I think that we've, we have to think about what we're leading. You, you, I mean, if you got family, I hope you're leading your family, right? You know, I, 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 I hope that you're leading a life that people can look at and, and emulate. So I think we're all there. I've also found that, that, that 
when I think of we all have leadership qualities is finding out what you can lead at or impact is, you know, if just so let's, let's think I got I got five actuaries to work for me. And, and we, we, you know, what we say is, can you go in the room and make, make the numbers work for us? And then <laughs> back, that's what we actually do. I know a whole lot more than that. That's, right. give, give it to the actuaries and make, let them make the numbers work. And then we're going to do it. But just think if we had a major problem at our firm and it could take us under. Those five actuaries are getting ready to lead us. And they may have never thought of themselves as leaders. We never know the circumstances that are going to come up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes circumstances come up that your talent is what's needed to lead us out. And so I always say to people, you may not be the leader in the sense of like you're the CEO or whatever, but if you do your skill, I need you to be ready to lead when we need you to lead. And the best leaders recognize that they don't lead all the time. Hmm. Find the people who can lead them. That's what's important. And so I think we all have it. We just got to figure out when it comes out. But you know, if you're not, if you don't think of yourself that way, then when we do need your skill set, then you may be hesitant, and that could hurt us. I want you to know your skill set, and when I need it, I want you to lead it with us. Love it. Love it. I, I, I just hope everybody's pen and paper is out. I, I really hope that their pens and pads are going and they have as much as many notes um, that, that I'm, <laughs> I'm writing down as we're, as we're having this discussion. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, so also with leadership, as you know, often comes criticism. And some of that criticism is warranted, you know, constructive and all that kind of stuff. And some of it is unwarranted. So how does one as a leader deal with both the warranted criticism as well as the unwarranted criticism? And that is a tough one because um, inherently we all want to be liked. Right. Okay. So let's just start there. I, you know, <clears throat> I don't care how tough I may want, I may seem, everybody wants to be liked. And, right. and so when you get criticism, it hurts. And I think that, Sometimes the less criticism you get, the more it hurts. Because you got used to hearing good things about yourself. All the time. Yeah. So criticism. So, man, it cuts a whole lot deeper than, than versus you've been hearing it every day. So right. it, is, it is very, very difficult. But here's what, what I say. So I take the criticism and I say, now let me apply it to what they're criticizing about me. Is it me? Are they criticizing about our strategy? Are they criticizing about, because mm -hmm. sometimes a critic, you got to put it in the perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm criticizing you because I don't like you, or I'm criticizing you because I actually think what you're doing is wrong. You know, then I'm going to look at those differently. Mm -hmm. So I have to understand the context and what it is that they're criticizing. Because if it's something that I believe we're doing the right thing, it just may be you have a different opinion. I appreciate your criticism. And, but I'm still going to keep doing what I'm, I'm going to do. And that's from the confidence I have that I've built up that I've paid attention to what I should be doing. And I really understand my job. That's the first thing. But I will tell you that, you know, as I've said a number of times today, and I'm always processing information, everything that everybody says, I actually think about. Even if I know, like, I'm like, I, I, I'm every which way I look at this one day, I'm still saying, well, but you know what, wait a minute. Wait just one more minute. Let me think about this differently. Let me think about their position and why they said it. Because now when I do that, whether I'm right or wrong, I may have a whole cast of people out there just because of where they're sitting and how I've messaged it. I really don't screw this one up. <laughs> so I process and think about every criticism that I can just to make sure I ain't missing something. And I think it's important for us to do that. We should not discount criticism. We should think about it. Now, you, you rationalize it through. Now, don't, don't try to like, I don't care what it is. I'm going to convince myself that I'm still right. But you <laughs> force yourself to think about it. Because, I, you know, my father always said, it might be some truth in there. 
And if there's some truth in it, you probably need to know it. Right. And and you and act on it. And and so if you don't, if you just, you know, yeah, I, I think, but again, it hurts, man. It cuts deep. It cuts because I get a lot of positive feedback from people. And then man, somebody criticizes me. I get, look, I got I had a situation come up recently. Like, you know, I'm trying to set a strategy, it's working and all that. Someone said, I don't understand our strategy. And man, I was fired up. I was upset the whole afternoon. I says anything I can do to help you. No, you can't. <laughs> why do people don't understand i've been doing this strategy for two years and then i got to thinking why would they say that and then i realized that part of our challenge was we ain't never defined what strategies everybody has a different definition of it so why wouldn't i have people saying i don't understand what it is right. and so now i'm saying like you know i think we ought to come back and really agree on a vocabulary and those same people that are criticizing said, George, actually, I think that would help. And then I used a couple of examples and then I realized there wasn't a disconnect on the strategy. Mm-hmm. We just were talking a different language. <laughs> and now, knowing what I've put into the strategy for the college and how it's working, and then to have somebody come and tell me, and, well, I don't know why I strategy, you know what I want to say to them? You ain't been paying attention then. <laughs> You got to think about it, but uh-huh. yeah, it cuts, it hurts. Just know that, but you know what? It, there's something in there I'm sure you can use. I love it. And I think that's just the growth of it. You know, I've always been taught feedback is a gift. And sometimes the gift is not in the wrapping. It's not in the paper. It's not the color <laughs> you want right. or that kind of stuff, but it's still a gift. Right. And, and, and oftentimes our biggest, um, you know, problems wow oftentimes are gifts in disguise, right? right? And it just takes you, you know, like you just said, you know, you're able to, to, you know, what can I learn from this? What else could this mean? You know, as you said, thinking about what people are saying, that there's a reason why they're saying it. Let right. me dissect and figure out what that, what that really is, because there's an opportunity to learn and grow as a result of that. So most of us don't process information, try to understand where you're coming from. They process it based on where I'm sitting. And I found leadership is important, especially the, the importance of communication. I always have to stop and say, why would they say that? Not, mm-hmm. and I'm not trying to like, you know, go after, I want to understand because when I evaluate things, I'm not trying to evaluate from my perspective. You know, mm-hmm. the rule of negotiations is to understand what the other person wants. Right. And then to communicate how you put what they want, what you want seems to be the same thing. So why would I just say, I don't know what, they they just obviously not smart. Where for me, it's really a matter of, I have to understand where they're at. And I'll tell you what, for the racism that has come at me, I do the same thing. Why? Hmm. Why would they do that? Because you know what, if someone told me that, well, because my mother told me to, or my father told me to, there might be an opportunity here that I could get them past that. But if their racism is because you know, black person took my job on affirmative action. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm in West Philly and somebody hurt me or something. I mean, those are different things that run deeper. Right. But, you know, you just lived in a house and that's what your parents said all the time. But you know any different. There may be an opportunity for you to grow. But if you're not paying attention to where they're at, you can't process that. Make, make, make a difference out of it. I love it. I love it. Love it. All right. Um, Last question. Wow, this is this time is flying by. Um, I, I love this. Um, and it just basically is um, what are some parting words of wisdom um for the students in our audience? Of course, you know, the organization is full of students as well as professionals. Yes. Um, what what are parting words you would give to this? It's the three-part question. What are the words of advice you would give to the students? What words of advice would you give to the mid-level actuaries? And what words of advice would you extend to the senior leaders that are listening? Yeah, oh, that's tough. Um, you know, and, but, but actually I'll tell you, they, they all may be the same. Um, f- first one, and, and you, and again, I, I, you said this, I, I give you credit for this. Open your mind. Open your mind. Be open to the things that come at you. Don't, this is all I want. This is all I see. Be open, open your mind up because there's so much around you. There's so much opportunity, knowledge, richness, joy, 
pain, all that's around you, but you got to take all that in. And so that's, that's the first thing I say to everybody is that we've, you know, I only listen to the news. I want to hear that validates what I already think. Well, that ain't opening your mind. Right. I ask everybody to open their mind and, and take in the things that are around. And that's the, the first thing that I would say that goes for all. Uh, for students, um, I want you to do something, start in college, and I want you to get better at it as you get older. Be curious. Be curious. I mean, if you're a student, I want to know everything. Just tell me everything. I want to know everything. Be curious. And hone that skill as you grow up in your career, as you get older in your life. Always be curious. That's the second thing that I, I would say. The, the, the third thing is, you know, we've talked about this. Think about what you can do for others. It's not always about you. So think about what you can do for others. I think that's important. And the, the last thing gets to this faith. And, and again, I want to say it in a broad context. So in respect of all religions and, and, and faiths and, and theology, try to recognize that is somebody bigger than you. Hmm. Now, I don't know, it could be Carl Mine. I'm not getting in all. You just got to find something that's bigger than you because the thing that I struggle with every day is if I got up every morning and said that the only thing keeping me going was what I could do, man, you know what I wanted to be? I wanted to be a truck driver. Think about it. I want to be a truck driver. Mm -hmm. George was thinking about is I'm going to make it to the NBA. Carl Malone bought him a truck, big old semi truck. I was so excited that Carl Malone, pro basketball player, played professional basketball, spent his money on a semi. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was what I was going to do play pro basketball, buy me a big old truck, and I wanted to drive a truck. But when I realized there was something bigger than me and that somebody else was really orchestrating this situation, guess what? George got to be the first on a lot of things. George got to meet a lot of people, got to do a lot of things. Look how small-minded I was compared to what someone else, a bigger force had for me. So that's what I would say. Love it. So open your mind, be curious, think about what you can do for others and recognize that there is something, someone greater ultimately than you. And I think those were some extraordinarily powerful, powerful words. And uh, we're so grateful uh, for your time today. Um, you know, it's not every day you get a chance to sit down with a college president who was the first of everything <laughs> lives. You know, so you know, so we wanted to just lean in and glean on, um, you know, all the information, all the nuggets, all the wisdom that you um, imparted upon us today. Um, I'll, give it, I'll, give, I'll give it back over to you. Is there one more thing? I mean, if there's one uh, more burning thing inside of you when it comes to leadership that you want everybody that's watching this or experiencing this conversation to walk away with, what would that be? I got to thank you. You've, you've made this easy. You've made this fun and, and energizing for me. So I got I, I to gotta thank you. Um, I, I just hope that everybody that's listening keeps listening to situations like this. Learn from each other. I tell you what, you all alone are some very talented people. Share your talents with each other and then build on those talents because we all need it. You are our future. I love it. I love it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, well, I'll give you the virtual clap for everybody that's tuning in. Of course, the membership, the allies, the, everybody, you know, tuning in from all over the world. Um, and we're so grateful, like I said, once again, um, for your time, for your honesty, for your transparency, um, and just really opening up um, in a way that I think a lot of times individuals don't see true leaders do, uh, because they do have those Instagrammable moments and always, you know, the, the snapshot, but we get to see the stuff behind the stuff today. And I know that I was blessed and I know that this was a great conversation uh, for me. As I said, I got my notes. I'm always learning and <laughs> growing myself. Uh, so, so, you know, watch out when some of my next speeches might have some of your quotes in them. I, I'll give you credit for it. Dar, I promise. Go, go right ahead, my brother. Go right ahead. <laughs> Thank um, you so so having much. said that, guys, it has been an awesome pleasure and privilege. Uh, we're back at it tomorrow um, at three o'clock. 
Um, we're going to have our express session. And I, oh, guess what? That's yours truly. Um, I'm going to be sharing some anti-procrastination tips um, and ways to help you ultimately, as I would say, get sugar, honey, iced tea done. Um, and then we're going to be following up with another interactive session just like this um, at four o'clock, um, a fireside chat and Q&A with four actuarial powerhouses, uh, none other than Art Randolph, Sharon Robinson, Erica Scherr, and of course, uh, Stafford Thompson. Um, so we're so excited to do uh, to, to be with you all today. Um, I believe there's another networking session, I think, at, after this. Um, so once again, guys, welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, the Visions Without Boundaries uh, conference this year uh, for the International Association of Black Actuaries. Once again, hats off, salute uh, to the incomparable Mr. George Nichols III. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you all once again, George. Thanks, Thank man. you so much. All right. Thanks. Have a great day and have a wonderful evening. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless.